Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Peaceful Parenting Podcast. I am so excited today to have with me Orisha Smolarski, who is going to be talking with us about co-parenting. Um, and, and by that, we mean parenting with somebody else who you're not currently in a relationship with. Welcome, Orisha. Hi, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me here. Yeah, I'm so excited. And um, before we get into like full introductions, I just want to tell how we uh, were introduced to each other, which is we have a mutual friend, Thana, and I did my training with Dr. Laura Markham with Thana, and Thana reached out to me about a year ago and said, oh, my friend Arisha has written a book about co-parenting. Would you be interested in reading it and, and maybe writing a blurb for it? So I read it, and I thought it was fantastic. And at the very end, I read something about your bio. And I realized that we uh, went to the same high school and you and your sister were in my sister's class and you were friends with my sister in high school, which I just think is hilarious. I know. It was such a blast from the past. It was such a, you know, amazing, you know, small world kind of coincidence. Um, and you wrote a, a really amazing, you know, uh, endorsement for my book. So well, I'm, I'm happy. I'm excited for it to get into the hands of other of parents. And I should add that you live in LA, I live in Toronto, and we both went to high school in Vermont. So it's, it's, it's not like we both live in the same city and coincidentally went to high school together. <laughs> Yeah. It's a really, it is a very small world uh, scenario. So tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Yeah. So um, I'm a therapist and I work with couples and individuals and co-parents and help them navigate, you know, different stages of their relationships. Um, I'm also a mediator trained in family and community mediation. Um, I've also been an educator and I've been playing music since I was a little kid. Um, so music has definitely informed the way that I work in really understanding the nuances of verbal as well as nonverbal communication. Um, and I um, have been a co-parent, co-parenting my daughter, um, who is 11 years old, and with my co-parent. And um, so that's been going on for now about six years. Well, and you and you've just written a book um, called Cooperative Co-Parenting. Yes. So, so um, all these experiences have, have led me to writing to writing this book called Cooperative Co-Parenting for Secure Kids, The Attachment Theory Guide to Raising Kids in Two Homes. Fantastic. And it's so needed because I get asked all the time um, when people are splitting up, um, you know, how what are the best things that we can do? so that this doesn't hurt our kids or, you know, doesn't hurt them as much as it could. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's so great that there is a peaceful parenting, um, you know, a peaceful parenting friendly book that's going to be coming out in January. As we're taping this, it's not out yet, but we'll put a link to pre-order in the show notes for anyone who who wants to uh, pre-order that. It's coming out January 2nd, I think you said. Right. And yes. so tell us just a little bit about what, you know, why you wrote this book. Yeah. So, you know, no one wants to hurt their kids, as you just said. I know I certainly didn't. And so my inspiration to write this book was really my daughter. Um, you know, at the beginning of our co-parenting journey, it, we were, it was a mess. Like, I didn't know how, what we were doing. Um, we definitely were bringing in a lot more conflict and tension. And, you know, I started to noticing, I started to notice that it was creating a lot of distress for my daughter. I mean, I remember the day that I, you know, walked into the kitchen. It was about maybe a couple of weeks in, about a month that, you know, we had separated households and she was sitting there, you know, on a stool looking down and I walk up to her and I could see like a tear coming down on her cheek and I lean in front of her and I was like, you know, what's going on, baby? And, you know, her eyes met mine and I could, she just looked at me and said, I feel all alone in the woods. Oh, yeah. And that was, the wake up call that I needed to realize that I needed to get out of my own emotional stuff that was happening and to look at what was going on in her environment that was causing so much distress. And I knew that I couldn't, you know, really rely on my co-parent to make changes. Um, so I had to, you know, look towards myself to make the changes in the way that we were behaving and interacting and, you know, communicating with each other because my daughter really needed both of us in her life to work together. And so, you know, I started doing some research and I got lots of books and I was looking at like, how do I do this? You know, how do I be in this kind of relationship? Because, you know, the co-parenting relationship is still a relationship um, and it deserves as much care and attention as a marriage or a dating relationship. But I found that there really wasn't a lot of information out there specifically on how to do this kind of relationship. Um, so, 
you know, I turned towards what I knew, um, you know, in the ways that I worked with uh, relationships in my work as a therapist. And so, you know, I turned towards attachment theory and, you know, what I knew about attachment styles and communication skills. And I started to apply it to my own relationship with my co-parent. And I noticed that those strategies really started to work. And so we moved from being more conflict towards cooperation. And I noticed also that started to create more ease for my daughter. And, um, and, I, and then I was getting some really amazing validation from my uh, mom friends who were like, you know, your daughter seems to be doing so well. She's always happy. She's doing great in school. Like, what's your secret? And so, you know, I was talking to colleagues and other friends. They're like, you should write a book, like write this down. And so my book really is kind of, you know, um, it, it helps co-parents navigate the rough terrain of co-parenting, which at first can be very confusing. And so I provide co-parents with like a deep dive into their emotional landscape, understanding like what their co- what their attachment styles are, what the attachment style of their co-parent is, so that they can learn more effective skills on interacting and communicating. And I also um, provide co-parents with a clear and easy to follow structure that helps them to create the secure foundation that their kids really need in order to thrive in two homes. And this way, the kids don't take on the burden of their parents' divorce. and Instead, they can feel free and they can bring that freedom into their lives today and tomorrow and into their futures. Yeah, that's it's so important. I remember my parents got divorced when I was 15. And even though I was older um, and there was the, the first couple of years were pretty uh, uh, painful for them in terms of like one wanted to get divorced and one didn't want to get divorced. Mm-hmm. And my sister and I were so caught in the middle and they didn't they didn't do anything that put us in the middle. We just felt in the middle because we knew they were so they were, in you know, having so much trouble and um they, they eventually worked it out and they're actually like really good friends now. And they even get together with their partners without me and my sister and we spend holidays together. And, and I'll tell you, and, and, and I know that's like maybe next level that not everyone's going to get to that point, but, idea, um, right? but you guys, it was such a relief. Long, Sorry. Yeah. It took them a long time to get there, mm-hmm. you know, it it's possible, you know? Yeah. And it was such a relief for me and my sister. Like, I just remember, and I know we're going to talk a little bit about the holidays um, uh, a little later on in our conversation, but I just remember that horrible feeling of like having the having to go back and forth and feeling like, sorry that you're leaving the other person alone on Christmas or whatever. And um, it's just, it's so hard for kids when the two people that they love most in the world are not getting along with each other. <laughs> exactly. Which is, which is why I you know, a big reason why I wrote this book is like, it's really about the kids. Mm -hmm. If you can focus on creating an environment where they feel safe and secure, even in two homes, they can, you know, kids can do really well. Yeah. You know, and, but often co-parents don't know how to do that. Yeah. And I often like to say is that it's not necessarily the divorce itself that hurts the kids. It's how you do divorce. You know, so if we can shift this narrative that divorce is really, you know, really bad for the kids and it's going to create harm and turn it more towards empowering parents to create a secure system and create this foundation that still, you know, operates as a a family and, and allows children to feel safe in their environments, kids really can still do really well and thrive. Well, let's shift into, let's shift into that. Um, what are some of, uh, I hate to start with a negative, but I think it's really informative to to have to frame the conversation this way. What are some of the really common mistakes that you see parent that you see co parents making? Yeah, so um, one of the common mistakes I see co parents coming into my office with is a lot of you know acting out of anger, out of revenge, out of resentment, and uh, trying to make decisions in that mind space. Um, so that rarely goes over well. Um, The other is definitely putting kids in the middle um, where kids feel like they have to take on, you know, roles that aren't theirs, you know, that they have to be witness to a lot of conflict or they're hearing negative things about their other parent or they are, you know, asked to be a messenger Um, where, you know, parents ignore 
the emotional or verbal cues of that their kid may be struggling. Um, I find that often parents, you know, might, oh, kids are resilient. Oh, it's okay. They're fine. And they, and, and they also don't want to seem like a bad parent that if they have to, you know, send their kid to therapy, that must mean that I'm a bad parent, which is absolutely not true at all. Um, so that's something that, you know, I definitely talk to co-parents about is, you know, leaning in, like, how's, how's your kid doing? Um, and, you know, taking advice for the wrong, from the wrong person, um, you know, family and friends are amazing to vent to, but they are not, you know, they can't give legal advice and also seeking legal advice from a lawyer who tends to be more adversarial, um, can also really be harmful to the co-parenting relationship. So choose wisely, um, and do your research and really find, you know, a lawyer and, uh, support people who can support your co-parenting team, because that really helps your kids. Um, also, I find that co-parents tend to minimize the value or, you know, a mistake that co-parents do is they minimize the value of the other parent to their child's life. That even if you are mad at your parent, at your, you know, ex-spouse, your child still needs both of their parents in their lives, unless, of course, there's abuse. Um, or, you know, so those are the things that I think I see most often coming into my office. Mm -hmm. I heard someone once say, um, I mean, this sounds a little bit harsh, but um, when you split up, you have to decide if you uh, hate your ex or love your child more. <laughs> yeah. um, and that yeah. that'll inform sort of your, uh, the, the way you go about, uh, you know, making decisions and, and interacting. Yeah. And I really coached you know, co-parents on shifting this mindset from me and you as, you know, married, you know, as partners who are no longer together with all the emotions and all the, you know, feelings that come from a, a breakup into it's no longer about you. Like the, the focus really has to change into it's about your child surviving and thriving. Um, and, and so helping co-parents shift that mindset can be really in, important and valuable in terms of how they even start to work together. Right. I think, um, you know, sometimes what I see is that, that good co like good co-parents recognize that, that even if it might be tempting in the moment to like throw their, their ex under the bus, mm -hmm. it will someday come back to kind of bite them in that their child will, they might not realize it when they're little or younger, but when they're older, they'll definitely be able to see like, oh, you, you know, you didn't support me in having a relationship with that other parent. So sometimes I'll even say like, even if you don't believe it now, it's later on, it's going to be a lot more important. Yeah. And that's something that I, you know, like to talk about as well is like what happens now, how we engage, how we interact affects our kids forever. And so, you know, some of the pitfalls of being put in the middle, you know, you're bringing that up. And I think that's important to talk about, right? Is like, you know, first of all, I think that it's a little bit of a hazy, you know, we hear this all the time. Don't put your kids in the middle, but what does it actually mean, right? It means putting kids inappropriately in a role that should not be theirs, such as, you know, being uh, your therapist or your confidant. You know, we often don't think about that as putting them in the middle, but that actually does because they have to now take on your feelings um, about the the marriage breaking up, um, you know, being witness to your conflict. You know, there is research out there that says, you know, like 46 percent of kids who are, you know, in high conflict divorces develop post uh, traumatic stress symptoms. Um, and, or being a messenger or being, you know, used as a pawn in, in, in the divorced, um, custody arrangements, um, you know, being asked to be a spy, all these really put kids, um, into these roles that like they, that don't belong to them. Right. And it puts a lot of pressure and stress. And what happens to a kid who's undergoing a lot of, you know, ongoing stress is they, their system goes into fight, flight, freeze, or fawn mode. And so, you know, they're in a situation where they have a lot of like their stress hormones are on blast. There's a lot of adrenaline and cortisol rushing through them and they don't actually have enough time to find homeostasis, you know, to, to find, you know, where the parasympathetic nervous system comes in. It's like, we're good. We're fine. We can relax and refine balance in their lives. And so what happens is that starts to create, you know, physical and emotional 
um, changes in them and, and affects them developmentally, which is what you were referring to, right? And so, you know, this effect can affect regions of their brain, um, such as the hippocampus, which is really necessary for learning and memory. It can affect their immune system, um, such as, so they might develop longer term, you know, uh, issues with stomach aches or headaches. Um, it will definitely affect their ability to regulate and their mood, you know, so they're going to be maybe more reactive, more aggressive, um, or even withdraw. Um, and it can affect, you know, mental health in terms of their, um, you know, develop depression or anxiety that can also follow them through their, their lives into adulthood. Um, and so we really don't want to minimize, you know, how much being put in the middle affects kids. And on top of it, it really affects their self-esteem and their attachment styles, right? We were talking about attachment theory. And so when a kid feels like they have to take on a certain role and take care of a parent's feelings or hear negative things about a parent, they start to internalize that as their own sense of worthiness in the world, right? Like, what do I have to do in order to survive? Survival for them means being loved by a parent. So do I need to behave in a certain way? Do I need to appease? Do I need to take care of mom or dad? Do I need to, you know, keep the peace between the two of them in order for my environment to feel safe so that I can survive, right? right and so my needs are met. Yeah, so that you, their needs are met, exactly. And so that starts to, you know, impact their own self-esteem. Um, so they take those negative beliefs about themselves into their futures with them as well. Yeah, it's so so let's let's shift to what the um the good things. To, oh, you know what? I want to ask you one more question about what you were just talking about before we shift to like what the what the best practices are instead of what we what we want to avoid. Um I've had parents ask me and I'm pretty sure I know the answer to what you're going to say, but um if the if the divorce was really let's say um, instigated by one person, maybe there's like infidelity or, um, really one person doesn't want to get divorced and the other one does. Um, I, I have a feeling you're going to say kids shouldn't be aware of, of that, those details of like an adult relationship. But I also think it probably is really hard for the person who didn't want to get divorced to have to say like, oh, you know, your other parent and I decided together that blah, 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 or however, you know, the best way to tell kids, can you just speak to that a little bit? Because I think that would be really hard as a parent. Yeah. I mean, that, this definitely comes up a lot where, you know, parents are like, I want to be honest. I want to tell the truth. And I think there's a fine line between telling the truth and telling kids information that is actually not theirs to have that's inappropriate for them. Um, telling them whose fault it was for the divorce puts again, a burden onto them to carry and to create um, perceptions about one parent or the other. All they want is to love both parents. And so even, even if it's true that one parent caused the divorce, they just want to love both parents. It doesn't help them to know specifically. And so to create this sort of narrative, and I talk about this in the book around how do you create a, collab a collaborative story about the divorce so that kids can carry that forward, you know, because kids are, they want information. They want to make sense of what's happening. And so um, they may ask a question, but it doesn't mean that they actually want to know who's at fault. They want help in understanding what is going on and, and how it affects people, them, right? Like what is this going to mean for them. me? Yeah. And are you both going to still be in my life? Mm -hmm. So you can provide a lot of reassurance through being a united front, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it takes a lot of courage and a lot of bravery and a lot of self care and a lot of work on not bringing in your own feelings about what happened, yeah. um, but instead really focusing on the needs and the emotions of the kid at, at that time. They're asking a question, let me tune into their need right now. They need help in, in creating understanding because they're having lots of feelings and they don't know and they're confused. Help me, mom, dad, tell me what's going on. Mm -hmm. It isn't about whose fault it is really. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Okay. So tell us about some, what are you, you know, obviously we're not going to cover everything in your book in a 45 minute podcast, but like, can you give us a couple of best practices um, maybe in about, uh, maybe about communication between homes? 
Yeah. So communication obviously is a really big one. Um, I like to look at communication based on our attachment styles because the ways that we communicate directly comes from our attachment styles. So if it's okay, I'm going to give us a brief overview of attachment theory and then get into best practices because, you know, I think it can really help co-parents in understanding, like, why do I do what I do? And why does my co-parent do what they do so that you can adjust in order to actually create outcomes that are more preferred? Because I find that people with insecure attachment styles tend to create the outcome that they really don't want. Um, so, you know, our attachment styles develop early on in childhood. As soon as we're born, um, they start to develop and are visible probably around the age of one or two. And it's dependent upon how our care, how present or consistent and reliable our caregivers were to our needs, to our needs for emotional attunement, um, to our needs for connection and for proximity. And, you know, if our co-parent, if our parent was not present to us in the ways that we needed, kids are going to start to develop, you know, adaptive strategies in order to to survive. Um, And so these strategies turn into insecure attachment patterns. So they're the three main ones are um, uh, are secure um, when a child actually feels like their parent is available. They trust that they can get their needs met. Um, the avoidant and anxious ambivalent are where we start to see these, you know, insecurities show up. So these patterns of behaviors follow us into adulthood and show up in our communication. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about like the how, you know, an avoidant might communicate based on how they were parented, right? So someone with avoidant attachment style didn't get a lot of emotional attunement. They didn't have a caregiver really leaning in, like, tell me how you're feeling, or yeah, that sounds really hard. You know, instead they may have gotten left alone a lot, or their emotions were minimized or even punished for having emotions. So they learned, my emotions are bad. Um, I'm just going to rely on myself. So their motto is really like, I'm fine. I don't need anyone. I'm super self-sufficient. And they really get sort of addicted to this kind of like alone time or independence. And they don't use a lot of like emotionally laden words at all because they don't have them. It's not in their vocabulary. Um, They may be very sensitive to criticism and shut down communication or leave the room if they sense, you know, someone is, you know, making them look bad or telling them what to do or they feel inadequate because they may have had a caregiver who was very uh, judgy or had very high expectations of them. So that's really going to, you know, so when an avoidant sort of shuts down a conversation or doesn't want to engage, that's going to trigger someone who has more anxious ambivalent attachment style. And the anxious ambivalent attachment style, the person with, um, the person who has anxious ambivalent attachment may be very verbose because they had an attachment parent who was not very consistent in their parenting. Um, they may have had a parent who was more preoccupied with their own emotions and their own needs. And that kid had to take care of their parents' needs instead of, you know, be able to count on them consistently to be there for their, for, for them. Um, so they learned that they had to maybe over-exaggerate their needs in order for them to be met. And so what that looks like is, you know, someone who sends out a lot of texts or uses a lot of like urgent messaging, a lot of emotions. Um, They need a lot of reassurance. They may need a lot of like maintaining connection because they're afraid it's always going to be lost. They're going to be abandoned. You know, so what we want is co-parents to realize that a lot of this precedes their relationship with this person. And so, you know, people with secure attachment, which is what I'm, it's the way that we want to communicate, right? Securely attached communication, where you can communicate and listen without judging, without blaming, without, um, you know, uh, causing any kind of like threat in the other person. So what does this look like? The first tip that I give is about really creating a space where there's respect and that you're operating with cordiality, really, you know, and a key way to getting into that is just bringing in um, appreciation and acknowledgements, you know, 
an example could be like, hey, I appreciate that you, you know, gave such a big lunch for kiddo. Can we talk about his favorite foods these days? Because I notice he's not eating a lot, right? That opens up a conversation it, um, as opposed to blame. Um, so I want to keeping the conversation really uh, short and brief, especially when it's verbal. Bullet points are your friend. Really one topic at a time so you don't overwhelm anyone, so they don't shut down. Um, and third one is really um, providing the relevant information. So the framework for this is just the, the providing the, uh, the who, what, where, when, and why. Um, in this way, again, you stay focused on your kid and um, it really helps co-parents have all the information in one place. Um, the fourth one is ask questions. Bringing in curiosity really helps both co-parents feel validated. It helps them feel included and, and it really values their voice. Like who doesn't want to feel that their voice matters, right? So you can ask, you know, like, what do you think? I'm curious to know more about, you know, what you're doing on that day instead of assuming or judging or criticism or blaming, which immediately will send co-parents into conflict. And then um, the, the last tip is always, you know, Roger, that is just responding in an appropriate amount of time and using boundaries around this, you know, like you can give a thumbs up or if you can't respond immediately because you're in the middle of something, say, got it. I'll let you know by Friday at 5 p.m., for example, or letting your co-parent know I need the information by next week, Tuesday. So all of these really create boundary uh, ways of communicating where co-parents can actually have, you know, a conversations where it meets both their needs and they don't trigger each other. That sounds really good. Um, yeah. It's, I, I, one thing that I kept coming back to when I was reading your book was um, it's so similar to um, peaceful parenting, like all of the, the, the recommendations. Um, and even, even in figuring out how to be a good co-parent, it still comes back to, it's all about me, right? Like, like the same way being, figuring out how to be a good parent is like, well, it's not really about my child. It's about regulating myself, working on my own triggers. Like it's about what I'm bringing to the, um, to the relationship with my child in the same way that co-parenting is like, what am I bringing in terms of like my self-regulation, um, you know, the boundaries that you were talking about. So I think, I think it's interesting that it's, it all comes, it always comes down to relationship principles, which is what I think you're talking about too, with the attachment styles. Absolutely. That's why I had to look back into early childhood development and attachment theory in order to figure out how to do this relationship better. And I do think that it really only takes one person in order to change this dynamic. Cause if you can be self-accountable, right, which is what you're talking about, like, what am I doing? What's on me to help change the dynamic here? Because um, a lot of co-parents blame the other person. It's them. They're the ones doing this. And then they, you just become reactive. So you lose your sense of power, actually, when you do that. Blame, I think, is like, you know, people think that it gives them a sense of like, you know, uh, feeling empowered, but actually does the exact opposite. You're giving your power away to the other person. So if you can look at within yourself, like, what's going on with me? What's my stuff? you know, um, then you can start to respond in ways that are actually more, you know, attuned to what you really need as opposed to being like at the other person's mercy. That makes so much sense. Yeah. It's, it's always, it comes down to like, what am I bringing to the, to the interaction into the relationship? One thing that comes a lot in my, uh, comes up a lot in my coaching, um, around when, when kids have two households is that maybe the other household is, got a lot different is a lot different in terms of like their parenting styles or their rules or their values and sometimes even like really quite dramatic like I have um uh someone that I know whose child wants to uh use different pronouns is not mm -hmm. it's not respected at the other parent's house um and wants to dress in a different way it's not respected at the other parent's house and it's as you can imagine extremely painful for the the person that I work with um and I realize that's a very large, a large example, but, but how do you suggest that parents navigate that um, when they do have really different values or rules from their co-parent? Yeah. I mean, I think different values and rules comes up all the time. It comes up even in single household families where, um, you know, could be either the lead to divorce or not. But I think this is such a, a great thing to think about because often 
parents will fight in the name of consistency, which adds only more conflict to the child's world. Uh, and and it again, becomes more about the parents and the kids continue to feel, you know, lost and not seen. And so, you know, of course, trying to talk to your co-parent about it and about like, what does a child need? You know, creating a sense of, um, you know, a dialogue with your co-parent if you can. Often that's not the case. And so um, what I, you know, especially in situations where it's not possible, is really about creating a united front. And how do you talk about the different values and different parenting styles with your child so that they can feel, um, so it's still about them. So you're in a way taking them out of the middle by, you know, letting them know, like, I get it. It's really confusing. It's really hard that you have two different messages in different houses. Um, staying consistent with your own boundaries and your own values in your home in modeling the way in which you want to um, raise your kid and the ways that you want, the values you want your child to have. Um, when we do this, you actually provide um, teachable moments. You have conversations about, you know, like, I get it. This is really hard for you. Your kid feels seen, but also you can teach them about the realities of the world. You know, there, there are different values happening all over the world right now um, and have always been. And so to talk to your kid about, you know, some people have different values. Some people see this differently. I know it's affecting you in this way. Um, what can we do about it? What, you know, to empower kids to have, um, you know, to, to, to develop uh, critical thinking skills and solutions building skills, and um, also where they feel safe with you to be able to talk about how it's hard for them or um, what they need. Um, it also, when you do this, it um, really kind of minimizes, you know, in some situations, kids uh, tend to use uh, the different styles or different rules as a way to pit the parents against each other. So if you just maintain your own boundaries within your own home, Kids can't actually do that as well, especially if you're validating their wants and needs. Like, I get it. You really want to have, you know, you really want to be seen as who you are, your identity. And I get that in your other home, that parent isn't accepting you in that way. How is that for you? You know, in this home, let's, let's bring that in. Let's encourage that. Let's, you know, celebrate that. What are ways that you want to express yourself? And then you put it back for the kid. What would feel good for you? What do you need? How can you maybe talk to your other parent about your needs? Um, depending on how old they are, you can start to empower them to talk about their needs, that their voice matters, and to, you know, bring that in in terms of how you might, you know, work with the, with the kid directly. I love that. What about something that's a little bit different, but still on the same um, idea? I, one thing I hear a lot, too, is, well, at the other parent's house, they have unlimited gaming time and really very few limits. And then they come to my house and they don't want to be here because, I mean, this is typically for older kids that I'm seeing this, but they don't want to be here because they feel I'm too restrictive. Um, what Do you have any, any ideas around that? I mean, I think that this is, let's look at restrictive and, and, and permissive, right? Like I think that kids need boundaries and they are actually looking for them. And so even if they're pushing up against them, that's their way of saying, I need you. You know, kids need to push up against, you know, limits and boundaries. Otherwise it's just destabilizing for them. And it's, 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 they don't have that structure and that sense of safety. And so even if you feel like, you know, they're mad at me, they don't want to be here. They hate my rules. If you're not, you know, you know, being very strict on them, like also like, check in with yourself. Am I being too strict? Am I being too, you know, too unreasonable? Let's look at what reasonable is. And really, am I actually meeting the needs of the kid where they are developmentally and their personality, like, and their interests? Like you first want to, what, what part am I playing in this? And then if it's like, okay, well, I'm holding appropriate boundaries. I'm going to hold them to that and reflect, you know, I get it. You really want to play games all the time, like video games, really fun. And I get it. That's like amazing that you get to do that at the other house. At this house, this is what we're doing. And I know that it's hard. And I know that the differences can be confusing. This is what we're doing here. 
I love that you that you started with also, or at least you included um, looking and making sure you aren't actually being unreasonable because I think a lot of parents don't, uh, they don't take that step to see mm-hmm. like, maybe I do need to be a little bit more flexible and give this child, you know, more freedom and autonomy as they're getting older. So I think it is always good to check in with ourselves before we stick to a limit that we've previously set. So I love that you included that. Um, and what are some some other things that I that I know are tricky for clients that I work with are transitions, um, oh, yeah. going back and forth between houses, um, both the um, you know when they're at one not wanting to go to the other, but then the not wanting to leave when they're at that house. Um, do you have any any specific tips around transitions and how to make those easier? Yes. Yeah. Transitions are really hard for anybody. You know, um, it's really hard to go from one environment to the other. Um, even if you're in one home, you know, like I don't know one parent who doesn't say, Oh my God, getting out of the house in the morning to go to school. What a just, you know, chaos. But for kids of two homes, they're transitioning between two different environments. And so consistency is so important. If you can create consistency between the two homes, that's ideal where their environments are similar, their routines and their structures are, are similar. And, you know, around bedtimes and meal times that they kind of know what to expect throughout, you know, between both homes. Um, if that's not possible, then definitely being consistent within your own home. Um, so that the kids know when they come to their home with you that they know exactly what you know what to expect. Um, in terms of transition days, um, some tips that I like to provide are really you know this whole idea around expectations, helping your kid um, prepare. Kids need time, so it isn't just like okay, we're going today. Even if it's a routine that they've been doing for a while, just talk about it the night before, that morning, and create really intentional connection times where you're creating meaningful moments, where there's lots of love and relaxation on those days, on days that they're leaving your house or days that they're coming back. Um, And um, the other thing is creating bridges between the two homes. So these, these can be like little objects, you know, it can be like, for example, my daughter has a ring, you know, um, I gave, we have matching rings. And so she carries this with her wherever she goes and her dad and her made like a little pencil case. And so she carries that back and forth with her. Um, and those are little momentums of the other parent, you know, also having pictures of the other parent, each home can be really helpful. Um, you know, allowing the kid to take their stuff. It's not yours. You bought them some clothes. It's their kid. It's the kids. They own it. Mm-hmm. They have a sense of like ownership and control can also be, you know, is just really, really important um, to keep the goodbyes and hellos really about the kids' emotions, um, not about yours, not like I'm going to miss you, but more I love you. Mm-hmm. And, you know, ha- whatever the kid is feeling, if they're having a hard time, is just connecting. Like it's hard to go from one house. I understand it, you know, and just being really attuned to their emotional space instead of your own feelings of like, sadness. Um, and I love this whole, I, you know, this, I, I talk about this in my book of creating hello and goodbye rituals, um, where it's something special for the kid to have for it. So if you have more than one kid, especially each kid gets their own hello, goodbye ritual, you know, it could, it could be anything. It could be like a hug or, you know, a little blow a kiss, or it can be like a whole little song and dance, whatever it is that is you and your kid have developed between the two of you that always happens every time you separate and every time there's a reunion. I love that. Um, So they know what to look forward to. Yeah, that's so great. Uh, We've got holidays coming up. Um, Mm. Do you have any, I mentioned in the beginning when I was talking about how hard holidays were for me when my parents were divorced um, or when my parents got divorced, do you have any tips on how to make holidays easier for kids when you are co-parenting? Yeah, this is definitely a hot topic right now. Um, So yeah, planning ahead um, so that you and your co-parent and your child all know what to expect. Last minute decisions around this always create much more stress and chaos um, and the kids feel it. Um, The other one is, um, you know, values. I talk a lot about values and I think the holidays are a really wonderful time to bring in this spirit of generosity and flexibility instead of competition. Our, we model, our kids are watching everything that we do and what we say and how we act. And so this is like the perfect moment, uh, perfect time to celebrate generosity and flexibility as values. Um, 
really creating a schedule that, that does not put your kid in a situation where they feel split in half. Um, you were mentioning like having to share the actual holiday itself. Um, and, you know, they may feel like take on some guilt if they're not with one parent, which you do not want, or they don't have time to play with their toys. They don't have enough time to really connect and lean into the experience that they're having. So, you know, be creative about maybe creating new traditions where the kids get two holiday celebrations. I mean, who doesn't like two holiday celebrations, right? And so you can turn this idea of a loss into a gain for your kid instead of one you know, let's say you celebrate Christmas or Hanukkah, they get two or yeah. they get one Hanukkah or one Christmas, you know? So this really centers around having fun and celebrating and creating meaningful moments with um, their kids, families and extended families. And then of course, for yourself, if you do not have the kids, it can be really hard. I get it. You know, it's, there's a lot of sadness and nostalgia and grief that can come up. So take the time to do a lot of self-care, create new traditions for you, um, connect with family and friends. You know, you can start to travel. If you start dating, this can be a really great time to explore, you know, those new relationships and, and explore the world with them. So uh, those are some of the tips that I usually offer around this time. That's so helpful. Do you, th this is a question that just occurred to me. Um, do you, I, I have heard of some parents who have the parents move in and out of the house. Um, I think it's called nesting, but I'm not positive. Nesting, bird nesting. What? Bird nesting yeah. or nesting. Do you recommend that if parents get along well enough to make that happen? Do you think that's better for kids than having two homes? I think that, well, I think you said the key thing. It depends on how well the parents get along. Because if parents don't get along, well enough, they're going to bring in more tension and conflict because now they're in each other's space all the time. They still have to share the same space. So issues of like privacy come up or right. who's cleaning uh, and <laughs> cleaning and who's buying more of this and who's buying that. They're still operating actually and having to share the home. Um, and that can, while it can be good for their kids, um, it can turn into something that actually is more stressful for the kids. Um, I think it can be a really wonderful way to create that trend, to slow the transition down at the beginning. Actually, my co-parent and I did this at the beginning, like for the first year, uh, my daughter stayed in the, in the main house and he and I would sort of um, would come in and out based on our schedule. And, um, and so I see that and I have a lot of co-parenting teams that do the same thing where, you know, until they really have found a solid structure for their kids and understand what they're doing and have everything in order because they need time, they allow the kids to stay in the same house and they are the ones who are doing all the back and forth for a time being. But I also notice that after a while, it becomes really burdensome um, to the whole system and the kids are actually more conscious of the the conflict and the chaos. Right. And, and if you get a new partner or something like that, then that brings a whole level of, um, does the partner supposed to move in and out? And like, it would be, I guess it would get complicated after a while. It definitely gets complicated. Yes. Yeah. And also where, where do the, the parents live? You know, sometimes they, people can, you know, share another little apartment, but I often find that, you know, people want their separate spaces. Yeah. That's yeah. the biggest thing. They're like, we're separating. We don't want they don't want to be in each other's business all yeah, the time. Yeah, they, they split up for a reason, I guess. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And here you are still sharing space, you know, and and so I think it's it's it can be really helpful to a degree. You know, I think it's something that also is unique. It depends on the situation, really. A lot of um a lot of pe people that I work with who are divorced have court mandated visitation like custody um agreements that to they strike, I mean, and I'm not an expert, but they strike me as being really hard on the kids. Like, like the two, two days, two days, one day, three days, like they, I don't remember there. Are, I know there are a couple common models which have kids moving like every couple of days. I don't know if it's like that where you live, but um, do you have a sense of from your work, if there's, if, the, if it's better for kids to see each, I think the reason is because they don't want it to go you know, a week without seeing one parent. But to me, that moving a lot would be, I think that would be really stressful on kids. Do you have a sense of if it's, if it would be better to have more frequent moving around or, uh, and not seeing the other parent or longer in one place and a, and a big gap from the other parent? I think it's really dependent on the age of the child and the personality and the needs of the kid. 
Um, so less separation between, you know, from one parent in terms of time actually is better for young kids, it's babies. Like it's really hard for them not to see the other parent um, and toddlers and young kids, right? So I think these schedules really are dependent on how the kid is doing. And I think it's important for parents to get advice and to take in, but also to really look at what's going on with my kid. How are they doing? And I'm, I mean, I'm constantly checking in, you know, we have the same schedule since she was little, since, you know, we, we divorced when my daughter was six years old and we basically have the same schedule with a little tweaks and because she loves it, you know, she's like, this is how I learned the days of the week. This is what I like. I know exactly this and this damn with my dad, this and this damn with my mom. And so her life is very routine and structured around that. Um, as she, you know, she's 11. So I'm anticipating she may want longer times, you know, to actually be, you know, maybe a week on a week off. So I really think that it depends on your kid um, and how they're doing. So I don't have specific advice on what's the best schedule. And I work with parents on, um, I'm on this and every parent group, every parent team that I have comes up with a different schedule if we do it this way and their kids like it, it, it you know, like it has to be where the kids do well. Yeah. And maybe also being willing to revisit as the kid gets older and Absolutely. see if uh, see if it still makes sense and just keep talking. Everyone keep talking about it and seeing what makes sense. Absolutely. That's, yeah. you know, any anything in the parenting plan is also has to have sort of like a caveat of like, we will be revisiting this based on the developmental emotional needs of our kid. That makes sense. Okay. Last question I want to ask you before our final, final question is, um, Again, and, and this is great because since I'm not a co-parenting, um, I'm not a co-parenting expert. I can, I can, I can take this into my own practice and use it. Um, but what I see sometimes is that you see some kids who, when their parents split up, they are like, "I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine," and mm. they don't want to. I don't know if it's because they don't want to burden their parents with their big feelings, and then some other kids like really act out and you know, lots of meltdowns, uh, provocative behavior. Can you just speak to that a little bit? Like the different, um, reactions, um, that parents might see when they do split up or when they are, when they are already co-parenting and, and the best ways to, to handle the, handle kids' emotions. Yeah. I mean, I think what you're describing are two kids who have two different attachment styles based on their parent their parents' attachment styles. So as parents, we bring in the ways in which we, you know, we parent and our own attachment styles. And so a kid who says, I'm fine, may have parents who may not be emotionally attuned or, um, you know, yeah, may not be able to handle their big emotions um, or miss it or, you know, not really that present. So that kid may be developing more of an avoidant attachment style and learns I'm fine as a way to not feel the pain of the rejection or the non-present parent. So if you um, see that, so if you saw that, you might check in with yourself and think like am I am I um making sure that I'm open to hearing about my child's feelings, welcoming their feelings? Um am I too maybe wrapped up in my own pain of this this split or whatever that might be kind of like a bit of a a bit of a I don't want to say a warning sign, but a bit of a yeah. take notice. I think that like really being curious and connected to your child. So uh, yes, the the first piece is like, what am I doing? What's going on? If my kid is saying I'm fine, okay, they may not really be fine. Even though that's how I do deal with things, they might not be. So even if I don't know how to do it because I don't have the capability or I don't know how to ask for help, you know, get some some feedback from a therapist or from, you know, from friends or books. So yes, attune to their needs. Let them know that you're there, that even if you're saying you're fine right now, I'm here for you when you feel like talking can be a response to the I'm fine. So they can start feeling like, oh, my parent actually is curious. And then, you know, ask them, how are you doing? Reflect their feelings. I'm noticing you're a little grumpy today. How are you doing? What's going on? You know, so you can help observe their feelings to them, give it back to them, reflect, listen, um, create these really amazing connection time moments, which I mentioned before in um, the transition, you know, during on transi- transition days, but you can do this every day with them where you really connect to their interests, you know, what they're going through, play with them. A lot of times kids act out their emotional, you know, experiences through play. 
Um, or through, you know, if they're older, you can sit with them and watch a show with them or, you know, ask them to tell you about their favorite music. And then you can talk about who they are, what they're interested in. That also helps them create a sense of safety and connectivity with you, which then will then allow them to feel like, oh, I can share my feelings and my parent can handle them. So when your kid shows up with a lot of big emotions, for example, the other kid who may be more anxiously attached, notice like, oh, do I make it about myself? Um, do I try to fix it or just, you know, like give a solution without actually giving them space to be heard, seen, validated without any judgment, without trying to fix it. Um, and so just staying really present and being with their feelings. Mm -hmm. I love that. This has all been so helpful. I encourage anyone to get your book um, if you're co-parenting. Um, and it's I think it's a, just a really lovely handbook for people to just do this work on their own. Um, and it really is in line with with the uh, everyone listens to my podcast who follows peaceful parenting. It's all very in line with peaceful parenting. Before I let you go, um, I always ask this question of my guests. If you could go back in time to your younger parent self, what advice would you give yourself? Yeah. So I would say to listen more and talk less. And I learned this again from observing my kid. Like I, you know, as a therapist, I always, I'm like, you know, let's talk about the feelings. Let's talk about a magnesium or let me like, you know, and sometimes it was just too much. And she would, you know, I noticed she would just sort of run away. And this happened once we were on a, we were on a, um, going on a hike and she was like not wanting to go on it at all. She's like, I don't want to go having a meltdown running. And I was like running after her to try to be there, you know, like I can't leave my kid alone. Like in my head, I'm like, I don't want to leave her alone to fe in her feelings. I want her to know that I'm present. Right. So there's that going on. And like, I'm like, okay, I am present. She knows that she sees me but she's running away. What's going on here? So, so I decided to like, okay, let me just do a mindful moment for myself of just like taking a breath and relaxing my own nervous system and realizing like, okay, what does my child really need right now? And I could see her. I made sure that she was visible, that she wasn't like disappearing into the woods. And then she just stopped at some point and just sat on a log and I gave her room and I was observing her and I, at this point, had calmed myself of like, I need to, you know, change the situation. And I just sat on the log. I went over slowly and I sat a little bit further down the log, but she knew I was there. And I just became sort of this, I use the analogy of a quiet bunny, which I got from a parenting book that I love. And I was like, okay, I'm just going to be here with her in this mindful space of just letting her know that I'm here, that her feelings are okay. That I'm not going to try to change or do anything, but I'm just present, quiet. And, you know, after a few minutes, I saw that she sort of turned towards me. And then, like, the distance became smaller. And then, you know, I just gave her a really big hug. And we didn't even talk because I knew what was going on. She didn't have to explain herself. And, you know... It, and the next day we talked about it a little bit, you know, you really didn't want to go on the hike, did you? And so that was like a really big turning point. Where I was like, for my kid, she really needs the being there piece of the connection, not always talking about the feelings because she's, <laughs> she's a little bit of an introvert, you know, which I love about her. And she now is so verbose in what she's feeling and thinking what's going on. And I've just practiced really like listening and then reflecting, but not really trying to like bring in all my therapy stuff. <laughs> I, I, I said to my dad once, a parent, I don't totally remember this, but my, my dad's a psychologist. And I said once, I'm not one of your clients. <laughs> or something yeah. Like, yeah. Something like that. So it also reminded me of, um, I don't know if you, my daughter is really into the Hamilton soundtrack and um, mm -hmm. in the song, uh, one song where Aaron Burr is singing, uh, talk less, smile more. Um, right. I actually have started using that in some of my, with some of my clients okay, practice talking less, smiling more. So I think that's yeah. it. <laughs> that's why I have one of my, you know, big things that I always tell clients is like, just be there, you know? And that definitely comes from mindfulness, right? Of just being there. And that's the ultimate of presence. Yeah. Yeah, and you don't kids, always have to know what to say. It doesn't really matter sometimes if you're just there with somebody. If you're just there and kids feel that connection in the quietness, in the just presence of being 
being there with them. And it shows like, I'm here. I got you. I can handle your feelings. Your feelings are okay. It says so much in this, in the quietness of the being there. Fantastic. Do you have a website or social media or anything yet for your book? Yes. So you can, on um, my website is arishasmolarski.com. I can also be reached at my Instagram, which is cooperative co-parenting. Also Facebook, same thing, cooperative co-parenting. And you can pre-order my book anywhere that you like to buy books. Okay. We'll put Just the link to all of that in the show notes. Yeah. Well, I look forward to, you know, if anyone wants to reach out and chat or you know have a session, I look forward to further conversations with other people. Perfect. Thank you so much, Arisha. Thank you so much, Sarah. It's been a pleasure to be here.